Welcome to our Facebook Live discussion. I'm Stephanie Stapleton, an editor here at Kaiser Health News. I'm Fred Schulte, a senior correspondent. And today we're going to talk about how Purdue Pharma's early OxyContin mar marketing strategy may have contributed to the nation's opioid epidemic. If you have a question or a comment, please post it to our Facebook page. Also, Fred recently wrote about this topic, and that story is on our Facebook page as well. But the real twist is that Fred's story stems from a cache of documents he has been holding on to that have been packed away in his basement for about 15 years since he was an investigative reporter in Florida. So, Fred, can you start out telling us a bit about the story you just did for KHN? Yeah, sure. The story was about how Purdue Pharma, which is the manufacturer of OxyContin, spent uh, millions and millions of dollars trying to promote usage of the drug uh, to get doctors to prescribe it for a wide variety of uh, different conditions. Okay, and along with your story, we have also posted a selection of those mm -hmm. documents right. from your files. Can you kind of give the, the viewers an overview of what they might find yeah. in terms of These that resource? These were the, 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 market, the company's marketing reports from, uh, there's uh, for annual marketing reports from 1996 through 2002. And basically it details every nickel that they spent trying to promote the drug goes into detail about uh, what kinds of things they need to do to, to increase usage of, of the drug. And it's very detailed and it's very interesting. Okay. Now, how is it that you have had these files for all of this time? Well, it goes back to in 2002, the, the Florida Attorney General, uh, who was, was getting alarmed by all these reports of overdose deaths and addiction related to OxyContin. Uh, decided to do an investigation of their marketing and uh, practices. And so Purdue Pharma voluntarily turned over to the state of Florida all these marketing reports and a lot of other uh, documents. When the investigation ended, it, it ended when the company agreed to pay $2 million to the, to the state. And um, the, my newspaper, the, the, the Sun Sentinel and the Orlando Sentinel, both we, we decided we want to take a look at these at these records. And uh, Purdue Pharma went to court to try to block the release of them, but uh, we won, and so we got we got the files. And then you wrote stories right. for a while, and we wrote a couple of stories, and uh, you know, uh, uh, daily uh, when the day that they were released, and uh, you know, describing the campaign, and also that there was this interview that they had conducted with a sales manager there who said that the company had uh, told its sales force to go and tell doctors that the drug was not really addictive. And uh, that, that struck us as, as big news. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, but you kept all of, you, you kept this, you used yeah. them back then and you just held mm -hmm. on to them all right. of this time. <laughs> right, <laughs> so. well, you know, I mean, uh, if you wanna be an investigative reporter, one thing you gotta learn to do is keep files. And, uh, you know, I've always had, uh, interesting chats with a lot of editors who think that, you know, the newsroom should be paperless, but sometimes you need documents and uh, investigative reporting usually does need documents. And, you know, this was a unique set mm -hmm. of, of records that have fallen into our lab. I'm not about to, you know, chuck them away. Mm -hmm. Well, as from one pack rat to another, I salute you for that. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, but back to the story at hand, um, can you, it, I read your story, and it definitely seemed that their marketing strategy was just a full court press. It was yeah. it was multifaceted. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was you know maybe even unprecedented. <laughs> I don't know. Can you talk a little bit more right. about how how they worked that out? What you read when you read those documents? Well, they they spread money about uh, around just every quarter of medicine. I mean, they they were in hospitals to try to get the uh, hospital committees to decide. Uh, which drug to use, to use OxyContin. They were calling on thousands of times, they were calling on doctors. They spent millions of dollars in advertising in, in uh, uh, medical journals that appealed to doctors. Uh, they funded conferences, they, they sponsored uh, patient advocacy groups. I mean, they just did about everything you could possibly do to uh, gin up business. Okay. Um, I also noticed one of the points when I was reading your article is that um, they seem to target physicians that may not, part of what their sales reps were doing was going out mm -hmm. to doctors who were not the <clears throat> normal prescribers of this kind of painkiller. Right. Can... Well, they started, they started out uh, uh, viewing OxyContin as a drug to use for cancer pain, but I think quickly realized, and this is all covered in the, in the documents, that there was a much bigger market, a much broader market for pain, such as back pain and arthritis and that, and that sort of thing. So they, 
they expanded and they went to doctors that were general practice doctors and internists and they called on them and gave them sales, you know, presentation on OxyContin. Okay. Now, for our viewers, can you clarify the timeline? Like, when do these, what, what is the period that these documents reflect? Yeah, 1996, when they uh, first started marketing it, through 2002. Okay. And how does that parallel what was going on sort of in the world around you mm -hmm. in terms of the use of these painkillers and like kind of oxy abuse and all mm -hmm. of that sort of thing? Well, it was kind of the very beginnings of what's become this national uh, epidemic of uh, drug abuse deaths and, and, and addiction. Uh, we had started about the, um, that same year that the Florida investigation started, another reporter, uh, Nancy McVicker, and I had started going around to medical examiners' offices, morgues, basically, in, in South Florida counties and looking at drug deaths and pulling the files and looking at them and seeing what kinds of drugs were involved. And one of the things we saw was that, that uh, oxycodone, which is the ingredient, cheap ingredient in oxycontin, was involved, uh, usually combined with sedatives and other drugs. In a lot of overdose, uh, in a lot of overdose deaths, and this was, you know, traditionally, people think of things like heroin and cocaine, you know, killing people from overdoses. But we started to see a lot of uh, pill deaths that were basically uh, a lot of times people who had gotten these drugs from their doctor, mm -hmm. and it was killing them. Okay. Now, um, if you are just joining us, I'm Stephanie Stapleton, and this is Fred Schulte. And we are talking about the marketing of OxyContin. If you have a comment or a question, you can post it to our Facebook page. So um, anyway, Fred, can you talk a little bit more about what was going on in Florida back in these early days? Um, what were you covering and, mm -hmm. and how aggressively did you have to pursue these documents? Well, uh, I was the investigations editor at the paper, and uh, we mm -hmm. regarded this as an investigative project, just mm -hmm. like any other project, uh, particularly uh, of interest to people because they had a lot of money being spent on these drugs, and you had people dying. And, you know, a lot of money and people dying usually comes together as a pretty good, uh, compelling story that we should, uh, we should tell. I, mean, I think that the company uh, thought at the time that we were doing a, maybe a disservice to people that legitimately needed these drugs, and we um, understood that. And of course, we understand that some people need these these painkillers. Mm -hmm. But the things that we were seeing by going around to these morgues were, uh, you know, some uh, like kid, you know, a seventeen-year-old kid or something that got this uh, somehow from a friend and crushed mm -hmm. it, crushed the pill and snorted it and ended up dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also had, which some people thought maybe was a little even more alarming, is that you had people that were taking these drugs, like a Xanax drug, with the with the the OxyContin, and uh, and it was killing them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, and you know, the doctors had prescribed these for them, and uh, they there was there was considerable evidence in a lot of these cases that they did have legitimate pain. It wasn't always just. Abusers, and I think that some people that were defending this were trying to say, "Well, there's a handful of people out there abusing. Any product can be abused." And we said, "Yeah, we did see that, but we mm -hmm. also saw people that that didn't appear to be drug abusers, but who ended up uh, getting into trouble." Okay. Now, when I read your story, another point that I noticed was like if you watch sort of the 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 places that the marketing was focused, there seemed to be. As time went on, they seemed the the company seemed to be investing mm -hmm. in um, addiction awareness and addiction education. Right. Certainly not investing mm -hmm. in the same level, but how right. did that fit into the big picture? <clears throat> well, uh, I guess about maybe there's it, it, still a matter of dispute exactly when uh, people started to become aware that oxycontin was was causing uh, uh, or contributing to overdose deaths, but. Uh, in the marketing reports, uh, the first one, I think in 2000, they start to, uh, to see that, uh, you know, we've got to try to spend some money on, uh, on addiction care. And they did, in fact, spend some uh, money on addiction care. But what they also did is they, they consistently blamed the media for uh, mm -hmm. writing about this and for causing it to, you know, causing all this al alarm. Right. Okay, which that kind of gets to my next question. As you guys are writing these stories, you've got the documents. How did the company respond? I mean, was there a big pushback? Was, you know, was there a yeah. counter campaign? Uh -huh. Well, they did. And, you know, they weren't, they weren't pleased, but they never disputed that, uh, that, uh, the drug was involved in a lot of overdose tests mm -hmm. because they couldn't. I mean, we're not experts 
we're just looking at the files and the medical examiner determines the cause of death is accidental uh, overdose and puts down this drug and this drug as the two that did it. Well, that's the official finding, uh, and and so we were just reporting. We were mm -hmm. just reporting that. But as I said earlier, they thought that uh, that um, uh, media reports tended to exaggerate the problems with uh, with the drug, and that we were doing a disservice. As I said to people that you know legitimately need these drugs, and um, well, now as you know, there's a lot of lawsuits that are contending that. Uh, that uh, the, the comp all the all of these opioid manufacturers knew about a lot of uh, dangers of their products and didn't didn't tell people. Right. So I want to get back to when your newspaper took the company to court, mm -hmm. uh, or the company went to mm -hmm. court and your news newspaper challenged it. But were you surprised that you all did ultimately get access to the documents? Uh, well. A little bit, yeah, but but not really. I mean, Florida has a pretty good open records law, uh, and mm -hmm. um, you know the company obviously that, that regarded this as a, a trade secret. Mm -hmm. That you know here's their plan. This is exactly what they plan to do. There's other people out there that are making these products as well that they compete with to try to sell, and and then now in the newspaper is their plans for how they were going to uh, proceed and and do this. And uh, they obviously weren't, weren't thrilled about that, but. Uh, you know, they went to court, they lost. Okay. And so what made, I mean, you've had these for 15 or more years. Mm -hmm. What made you decide now to go mm -hmm. back and look at them and write about them again? Well, it's become a big issue now. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it never really went away as an issue. I mean, it, it got, but the number of uh, deaths uh, has only gone up and up and up as this epidemic has gotten uh, worse and worse. But there are a lot of these lawsuits that are, uh, there's a whole bunch of them, over a thousand of them, and in, in, that are consolidated into a case in Cleveland that are alleging that uh, this is a long standing, years long uh, uh, conspiracy, I guess. I mean, I mean, that's not the right word, but uh, that it was this long standing effort by these companies to push products that they knew were, were not safe. And, uh, in light of that fact, I mean, these are these are their marketing reports, and I think that uh, I thought we here at Kaiser Health News thought that well, we could just put them up, and people can read them for themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take my word for it. Mm -hmm. You can look for yourself, read the report, and see whether you think that it was uh, appropriate uh, in the way it marketed the drug. Okay, and you mentioned the the current lawsuits that are pending, and a number of those come from states attorneys generals. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, because I covered the tobacco mm -hmm. lawsuits back in the day, mm -hmm. it clearly is, I mean, it just seems so clear that they're taking a page from that playbook. Right. And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think the lawyers that are pursuing these cases hope, yeah. hope that's, that's, Th the, that's case. the case. But, but I think that, you know, people will rem of a certain age, anyway, will remember those guys, you know, were raising their hand in front of Congress about uh, tobacco and uh, uh, and the issue was whether they knew about the uh, the can cause cancer or not, and whether they uh, were forthcoming about that. And I think some of the lawyers that are involved in these cases think that many of the same kinds of uh, deceptive marketing happened with opioids, and then a lot of people ended up uh, either you know addicted to them or or dying mm -hmm. of overdoses because they didn't understand that there were certain risks, and there were a lot of risks. And what kind of response have you gotten to the story this time around from the the company and from others? They didn't. Um, well, the company, this uh, Purdue Pharma, sent a statement uh, mm -hmm. saying that uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that they uh, that it's uh, doesn't make sense to look at what happened 15 years ago and try to blame that on you know what, what's going on right now or say that the activities that they undertook that long time ago and that's. Yeah, that's not for me to judge. Like right. I said, we just, you know, here's the, we're just putting this stuff up and you can judge for yourself. Okay. And just to be clear for our viewers also, the, you've, the, what we've posted in terms of the documents are a selection of some right. of the, the marketing reports. Mm -hmm. Is that right. correct? Right. Yeah. They, uh, they, you know, they said there's an annual one for each, each year and you can go through and see how they changed uh, the marketing and, and uh, you know, how uh, where they spent money and how much money they spent here and how much money they spent there. And uh, 
you know, I mean, some people may think it was a lot of money spent for uh, for a drug that isn't, you know, that that that's a that's a narcotic drug that mm-hmm. you know has obvious dangers. Okay, and we're getting to the end of our questions here, but I just kind of want to wrap up, and we've touched on this in lots of different points, mm-hmm. but in your view, I'd love to like these documents. How are they? How are what are the insights they? provide for what's going on in in our world right now with the opioid epidemic mm-hmm. all of these pressures well i think they show that that this is a, a business and a competitive business and that uh they're sales people and they're they're out there selling uh selling a product and mm-hmm. that's fine <clears throat> you know the the issue the, b- becomes potentially problematic is if they're uh, not telling the truth about it, or if they're misleading, if they're coming in and seeing doctors and telling them things like, well, you know, this drug's totally safe, or this drug, yeah, you know, very few people get addicted. Uh, well, there's this pseudo addiction, but they're, they're not really addicted. And, and you make all these kinds of claims that, uh, that you don't have scientific data that back up. Mm-hmm. Then it gets into, are you misleading the public? And then, uh, then that's a problem. Okay, great. Well, that concludes our Facebook Live discussion for today. Thanks for spending some of your lunch hour if you're on the East Coast with us, and we'll see you again soon. Great. Good to be here. Thanks.